Hello and welcome to another edition of For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. My guest today, a first timer on the show, Tom Kasparak. Did I say that right? Ka Zach. Casper Zach. <laughs> I will get it right sooner or later. Tom is a volunteer for Donate Life Connecticut. He's also written a book. He's also a, a donor family member. So uh, we've got a lot to get to. We will when we come back. So stay with us. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. My guest today, Tom Kasperzak. He is a volunteer for Donate Life Connecticut, and we're going to get into that a lot. He's also a donor family member, and he's an author. We'll get to his book in a little bit, too. First of all, it's your first time on the show, so welcome to the show. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate you having me. Uh, we'll talk about Donate for Life Connecticut. Before we get to that, uh, there's a reason why you're involved with it. Uh, so we want to kind of get your background and talk about your personal story a little bit. Well, Sean, um, my wife and I have been married for uh, 38 years. We had four children. Um, at, at age 36, we ended up having twins. One of our twins uh, born was Mary. She had Down syndrome. Her twin brother, Nick, um, was born quote unquote normal. But we've got involved with Donate Life Connecticut because over the years, um, having, having a child with Down syndrome, Mary ended up passing away at the young age of 15 years old. But over the course of her short life, we understood all of the medical issues that she had. And she didn't have that many of them. But in the last year of her life, um, she was going through different strokes she was having. Um, she passed away of a, of a major stroke that cut off the blood flow to her brain. And we ended up donating her organs. And as a Down syndrome person, most people with Down syndrome, a high majority, have abnormal hearts. Given what we went through with Mary in her last year and all the medical tests that were done with Mary, we realized and were told that Mary's organs were all perfect, unlike most Down syndrome wow. people, including her heart, which was totally normal, just as any other person's would be. So we ended up donating Mary's organs. And um, subsequent, a year later, we were one of the few people, I think, in the country, and if not the world, who ended up meeting the woman who received Mary's heart. So we've become very passionate about Donate Life Connecticut and sharing the story and helping others understand the importance of becoming and registering as organ donors. Well, that's an amazing story, especially <laughs> the part where you, you almost have a part of your daughter in this other person that you met. I mean, that's amazing. It's, it doesn't uh, happen that often. No, it doesn't happen that often. We were very fortunate. Um, there was some hesitation on our part right. when we were f first asked if we wanted to release our our name and information to this person. Did but they seek you out? or They actually did. We, we ended up writing, uh, what happens, the process, Sean, is you write at letters anonymously that are passed through the New England Organ Bank. And they basically filter the letters to make sure that things are said that are appropriate. And then they end up passing the letters on. Well, all of our letters to this person who received Mary's heart and all of her letters were delivered both ways. So once that happened and the New England Organ Bank got a good feel for where, we, where our heads were versus where Carrie was, and her name is Carrie Keenan, she lives in New York, uh, Carrie said to the New England Organ Bank, I'm, I'm desperate to meet them. Would they allow me to meet them? So after a little bit of consideration, we, we gave our, um, signed off and said, yep, we'll give the legal authority to release our information. And just about a little over a year after Mary passed away, we met Carrie for the first time. I can understand how it can tug at the heartstrings a little bit and why you would have to pause and think about it before saying yes yeah. to it, you know? Yeah. This isn't just any person that you're meeting. You know, no, there's, it's a lot involved, and, and obviously there's a lot of emotions that are involved from both sides. Were you able to hold it together? Um, the first meeting, as many meetings are really tough, yeah. you know, because no matter what, we hug each other and you've got tears in your eyes because it's such a profound effect that we have on other people's lives as she has on ours now. So it's tough. It always stays emotional, but over years you learn to manage it a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when, a, when a, a tragedy strikes a person or a family's life, um, they I instinctively get involved uh, it, it, in the sake of, of speaking about Donate Life Connecticut, um, and, and this is involving, uh, you know, the advocacy of organ donation. You, uh, you have a vested interest, certainly, we talked about this off the air a little bit, about getting involved and 
having people learn from your experience, helping others. So obviously there was a natural um, desire on your part to want to get involved some way, somehow. Talk about that. Well, Sean, as you said, when, when you're in that situation and you make the decision, uh, on, since Mary was a minor, we made the decision to donate her organs. It obviously is a very personal decision that you make, but Mary was always the type of person that she, oh, she loved other people so much and she had such a profound effect on them. She was very kind, very patient, very generous, very loving, very forgiving, had a great sense of humor. So when we donated Mary's organs, we made that decision. It was almost a natural process for us to say, this is what Mary would have wanted. And it, it does have a profound effect on people. Once you're personally involved, yes. and you understand the impact that it has on another family who would have lost their child if it wasn't for the decision that organ donor families make, um, we kind of stopped that process of having somebody else pass away needlessly yes. when there are organs available that could save their life. Especially after you learned, because normally Down syndrome individuals, their, their organs aren't donatable. Most of them, right. most of the time, especially their heart. Uh, but in Mary's case, as I said, they were, they were all normal. Uh, Mary ended up saving Carrie's life, who at the time I believe was 34 years old. Um, she had, doctors said she'll never see her 35th birthday. So Car Mary saved Carrie's life. She saved the life of a 16-year-old young lady who needed a liver, so she received Mary's liver. There was a 50-year-old woman who received Mary's pancreas. Wow. And two other separate individuals got one kidney each, which enhanced their lives and took them off of dialysis. Look at the lives. Look at all the lives that she's affected in a positive way. Yeah. And obviously, from when that happened, you've certainly follow uh, advancements in research and, and, and progress medically. Uh, transplants, the survival rate is much better these days than it's been in the past. Yeah, and, and we can talk about this a little later also, but because of the advances in medical technology over the years, the, uh, the transplant success rates have skyrocketed uh, to the point where there's just not enough organ donors that are registered to yeah. save the people who are who are on waiting lists today. And that's what we're here to talk about too, that, that natural uh, desire to want to get involved in some way to help others translated into Donate Life Connecticut for you. So let's talk about the organization, what it is. Well, Donate Life Connecticut was formed uh, by a group of key agencies and organizations in 1985 who f obviously felt the need to make more people aware and educate more people to, awa to be aware of the need for organ donors and tissue donors. So this coalition got together and formed the group Donate Life Connecticut. There are Donate Lifes across America now in every, virtually I believe every state. But the organization's primary mission is to help educate people to the great need of organ and tissue donation and also help people to, to help them perhaps register to become organ and tissue donors. And uh, I'm sure as far as you're concerned, the word can never get out enough to talk about the, the you know, your desire to want to get people to, if possible, to donate organs and affect positively someone else's life, just like your daughters did with so yeah, many other Sean, people. Sean, today, um, because of that success rate with the medical technology advances, advances there are over 114,000 people who are on the waiting list for organ and tissue transplants today. Um, it, when you think about that, that is a, an, a huge number of people just in America. If you think of the Super Bowl and watch the stadium filled, there's another 10 to 20,000 people overflow. That's the same amount of people who are waiting for organs. 18 people die across this country each day needlessly because of the need for organ and tissue donation. So it, it certainly is, we can never stop, as you said, helping people educate to the need of, of what's out there and how they can affect other people's lives in a positive way. And getting the word out, you certainly, you're a volunteer for Donate Life Connecticut and you know your background uh, helps you be sort of a, 
you know, a person, a public relations person, just to come on shows like this. You you do some motivational speaking, some public speaking. I do. So that, so that helps uh, your ability to be able to articulate to people why it's so important. Right. So that's a help, that's a benefit. Yes, it is. In fact, um, I, I before Mary passed away, I, I did leadership seminars. I did motivational speaking on corporate leadership. And once Mary passed away and I ended up writing the book, and I didn't never had intentions of actually writing the book, Sean, but we were so devastated after Mary passed away that for me it was almost therapy and somebody said why don't you just write all the things that Mary taught you because Mary became the greatest teacher, earthly teacher that I ever had. Uh, here she was a little Down syndrome person and for many years it was my wife and I who thought we were sacrificing our lives to help her become the best person she could be. But somewhere around maybe eight or ten years into her life uh, it became very clear and evident to us that it was Mary who was teaching us some very profound lessons. Um, so I've incorporated a lot of those lessons into the book and also into my motivational speaking. So it has a very personal effect on a lot of people. So if you're a parent, and even if you don't have children, you could relate to a lot of the stories and the, and the simple and pure lessons that Mary taught us. Let's uh, talk about the book when we come back, but in the meantime, let's go to a, a uh, have people go to a website and learn more about Donate Life Connecticut. Is there one that they can go to? Yeah, they can go to uh, www.donatelifeconnecticut.org. It'll give them a lot of information, of the history about the organization, the activities of the organization, and it'll also tell them how to volunteer if they're interested in volunteering or how to register. They could sign up and register right online to become an organ and tissue donor or if they want to send a, a monetary contribution that is tax deductible, we welcome those because it takes a lot of uh, uh, income and, and revenue to yeah. keep the organization going so we can educate more people to its value. Tom Kasperzak, got it right that time. Uh, Donate for Life Connecticut volunteer and also an author. We'll get to the book and a donor family member. We'll take a break and be back. I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. Stay with us. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. My guest today, Tom Kasperzak. He is a volunteer for Donate Life Connecticut, also an author. We'll get to the book in a second. Um, I was wondering if you were aware of the recent uh, addition that Facebook did with their organ, organ donation uh, thing that they added to it. Yes. Uh, the timing is just perfect for uh, what we're discussing today. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um Facebook, uh, the founder, uh, Zuckerberg, added, added this to his Facebook site, and within days there were thousands of new um, organ and tissue donors that signed up immediately. So it was one of the more successful things that was done as quickly as it was, but that shows the power of social media. Absolutely. And, the, and uh, you know, the reach that it has across the world. But uh, interesting, it's my understanding that he had in his family a personal scenario that it had that had to do with organ and tissue donations. So and that's it, why he got involved. And again, it just goes to show you what we talked about earlier is when you have a vested interest in some way, when it personally touches you oh, yeah. or your life or your family in some way, there's no better motivation to get involved in something sure. like that. Absolutely. I understand that it, he, he had recently he just got married and his wife, his bride, new bride, was the one that sort of, you know, kind of nudged him on to also do it too. And he had mentioned that every time a, an organ donation registration is made, her face lights up. So, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, it's just a win-win for everybody, yeah. really. Her face and a lot of other faces. Yeah. Those, those of us who understand and value and appreciate what happens when you become an organ and tissue donor has such a profound effect, not only on your life, but on the lives of the people that, that are receiving the organs and tissues. So you, Tom, as uh, you know, you, you're on the show today telling your story and talking about Donate for Life. There's many ways to express yourself on TV, on radio, and also in book form. You decided, we talked about this uh, just uh, toward the latter part of the first segment, you decided to write a book. It's called Plain Vanilla with Rainbow Sprinkles, An Inspirational Journey of Faith, Hope, and Love. So I, I want you to talk about the book and also uh, the, the title because it's very interesting and also an inspirational title too. Well, Sean, hold it up. I, I never had any intentions of writing a book when I was literally writing my, my, my memoirs, if you will, of the things that Mary taught me in my life. It turned in for me, it was therapy. 
and about a year and a half into literally writing uh, a various number of nights during the week of being in the basement where our computer room was located and my wife saying, you know, and I was crying oftentimes down there remembering all the things and, and missing our daughter, but a few months after it was pretty much completed, of all my memoirs were completed, uh, a lady by the name of Kathy Green who started the Lighthouse Voc Ed Center, it's an organization that caters to the needs of special needs children and adults, Mar Although Mary went to the regular school systems in East Lyme, Connecticut, um, she went to Kathy Green's Lighthouse Voc Ed for social activities at night with other people with disabilities. So Mary w did this for years and she loved it. Kathy begged me and Joanne to have me share my thoughts of Mary because she knew Mary in intimately as she knew us personally. I didn't want to do it at first. I said, uh, I'm too embarrassed by some of the things I wrote about how Mary in her simple, pure innocence made some points that were so profound and I felt foolish as a normal person, somewhat intelligent. Um, but she, she begged us to read it and we handed her the notes and we said, please don't share it with anybody. A Couple months later she came back. She literally came to me in the parking lot of where I worked, waited for me in the morning and begged me to turn it into a book. And, she, and I said, I don't understand why, Kathy. I said, I couldn't do that. I said, I, will, I, don't, I, don't, make money. I don't want to make money off of my daughter's story. And she went, first of all, you need to write a book because there are so many people that will benefit by how, your, how you viewed your own daughter um, versus how a lot of other people view their children, especially with disabilities, regardless of whether they're dis disabled or not. So when she said that, I says, Kathy, I said, that might be so, but I said, I still wouldn't make money. I didn't want to make money off of my daughter's story. And she just looked at me and she went as, well, wait a minute, how about donating the money? And she so didn't even have to say it and so I, I got it immediately. Yeah. So I said, donate the money to you. And she went, we could always use more funds to, you know the things we do. So after a little bit of consideration and not knowing how to write a book, I literally just wrote 12 chapter titles to try to put it in some kind of a sequence and then I filled in the, the blanks from there based on those stories that I remembered. Is it tough to publish a book? There's a, you can self-publish a lot. It's easy to do yeah. these days, isn't it? It's very easy to do, but it took me uh, probably close to two years of doing research, going through the normal publishing right. and realizing, you know, More this, trouble than this, it's worth. this yeah. could take years and years. I'm just going to self-publish it. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, on the, by the way, can, is this book available on the Donate Life Connecticut website? Um, I, I, what you do is people could I literally, um, they could contact me just through my own email, but they can, it's, it's available online through Amazon, okay. through the different bookstores. So all they have to do is Google either myself or Google Plain Vanilla with Rainbow Sprinkles and they'll have access to it. I would venture it. to say that more people are going you know, through the Amazon online sure. of the world these days as oh, opposed yeah. to walking into a... Yeah. A bookstore. Now you mentioned your daughter's age of 15, correct? Mm -hmm. correct. So, and it got me thinking of, uh, you know, uh, getting the word out and ad ad advocacy with uh, at a young age to people. Like, for example, schools. Are you in the schools? Are you talking? Those uh, kids are getting ready to get their license. I know they can't, you know, donate organs or they can't agree to it until they're 18. But that's an age to start kind of putting the buzz in their ear, correct? Yeah. That's correct, Sean. In fact, the organization Donate Life Connecticut, including myself as a volunteer, oftentimes will go into the schools, inform the schools, the teachers, the, uh, the administrators. Uh, they'll allow us in, share the story. When it comes down to minors, in order to, to sign up to be a, a, an organ and tissue donor, you need to have an adult or a parent's signature alongside, but anyone at any age can become a, an organ and tissue donor Age doesn't matter. Even people say, well, is there a cutoff age where you could, you know, if you get so old, it really has nothing to do with age as long as it has a lot to do with your health and the health of your organs. Um, many people donate tissues. Um, each year there's about, a, I think, well over a million and a half operations where people, health, pretty healthy people, will end up receiving tendons, ligaments, um, skin to, to treat burn victims, corneas to restore people's sight. So there are, there are, that's in addition to the normal organ transplants. And I think last year there were about 28,000 organ transplants done in the United States. And obviously uh, 
we could use a lot more people to become organ and tissue donors uh, because those numbers are going to continue to rise as medical advances continue. You know, and that's exactly where I was going to go, and you kind of started doing it for me. I, I wanted you to talk numbers and kind of, you know, almost as a way to, to uh, get our viewers to really understand what's at stake and who, how many people are actually waiting and how few people are actually donating at this point. Yeah. Well, right now the, the numbers are increasing because of the things like Zuckerberg and what he's done with Facebook and the more opportunities and uh, organizations like yours that welcome us on to share the message. So the numbers are increasing slowly, but when you come down to it, each individual who agrees to become an organ and tissue donor has the opportunity to literally save or enhance the lives of anywhere between 50 to 75 other people because of not only the organs, but the various tissues throughout the body that can be donated. Um, the other important thing to understand is that when you sign up to be an organ and tissue donor, you can specify exactly what organs and tissues you just want to. If you want to limit the number of organs and tissues you want to donate, you can certainly do that too. So there's a, there's a lot of leeway that they give you, but as I said, the, it's very easy to sign up. You can go to the website at the motor vehicles, in fact, the year after the organization was formed in 1985, they formed the, uh, the agreement with the Department of Motor Vehicles where every time a license is either gotten for the first time or renewed, they ask you if you want to become an organ and tissue donor. So it's very easy to do it then and just sign up, but just as importantly, it, they need to share it with their family that this is their wishes and their intentions to become organ and tissue donors when their time comes. What, what do you think the reason is that some people might be hesitant about becoming a donor? Um, uh, maybe in, uh, in some cases, maybe religious reasons, or, or what do you think the reasons are? Uh, it all depends, and they're very personal sometimes, Sean. You know, sometimes they're religious, but I will tell you that I believe every major religion known to man does endorse organ and tissue donation today. But it comes down to people's personal preferences, you know, and I, I, I really don't even want to repeat some of the things that people have told me because I, I don't want, I, to me it might sound so awkward, but to them it's a very personal thing and I, and I respect that, for, I, I respect all of them. But um, for me, I have a firm belief that once we live here, we're going to be renewed in the next life, you know, no matter what happens to us here. So, you know, my old saying is, uh, God doesn't need your organs and tissues here. We need them down here on earth right. to save other people. But the reasons, uh, Sean, could probably fill another, another taping of another show. <laughs> but um, we're just here to educate people as to, and there are some people, I guess some people still believe that if, they're, if they go into a hospital um, and, and the doctors and nurses understand that they're organ and tissue donors, they won't work as diligently to Good save point. their yeah. lives and that is absolutely completely false because right. they take an oath that they're there to save people's lives there first. I think because they think that, that doctors are aware that there's such a shortage in certain, depending on the organ or tissue, that, ooh, here's an opportunity. And you're right, it's just, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's, uh, it's absolutely false. Uh, they're there to save people's lives first. And, in the, and, and when they can't and the, all, all their avenues to save that life are exhausted, then it's a matter of you have an option to become a hero to somebody else in their family by saving their lives or enhancing their lives. Are the numbers up? I mean, m with medical advancements, um, more people are diagnosed, but maybe it, then they're discovered that they more people need organs. Are, are things looking up? It, it, are we moving in the right direction? We're moving in the right direction only because there's more and more efforts being made. There's more, there's more funding for this type of activity so we could educate people. Um, there, I believe on average, every um, 11 to 12 minutes across the country, another person is added to the waiting list. So the number of organ and tissue um, f people who need those organ and tissues are increasing at a steady rate. And those numbers every 11 to 12 minutes, somebody else knew, is only because the success rate for organ donation and transplant and tissue is so high now and successful that they know that there, there's an alternative to save people's lives, but we need to get more people to sign up to become organ and tissue donors. We're going to put the website graphic back up on the screen one more time for people to go. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, it was my pleasure, Sean. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to share the story. Tom Kasperzak, he is a volunteer for Donate for Life Connecticut, also a donor family member himself and uh, an author, too. 
Uh, and so uh, please maybe get the book, read about it. And uh, again, thanks for being on the show. That's our show for today. I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. See you next time.